is the third lecture in um, Software and Security Engineering and the first segment. In this lecture, uh, we're going to um, start tackling issues around psychology, which is really important for both safety engineering and security engineering for all sorts of reasons, uh, from um, how people deal with risk um, to um, various types of mistakes that people make. Um, and we're going to start off with errors. And errors arise at different levels in the cognitive stack. And a good way of seeing this is to think of what happens when we deal with a new problem. Um, well, given a problem for the first time, you um, think about it, you um, try and do some kind of analysis of whether it will be dangerous to do one thing or another, and then you try this and you try that. And um, depending on how successful you are, uh, you, you may find a simple way of dealing with it or you may evolve a more a complex set of rules. And over time, these rules will become partly automatic and the rules will give way to skill. Think about when you learn to ride a bike or if you've learned to drive a car, what was involved in doing that. Um, you no longer think about how to stop and start and change gear, for example, once you've been driving for 10 or 20 hours. And this means that you can concentrate on, on other things, such as paying attention to what's going on on the road and anticipating what other road users might do. Now, this is great because skill is more dependable than having to work out things from, from first principles, but it does bring some consequences in its wake because um, you can have absent-minded slips, you can follow the wrong rule, right? The, um, the skill that you've developed can capture you and uh, can cause accidents. There are also systematic limits to rationality in the way in which our cognitive um, capabilities um, interact with our instinctive capabilities, um, the so-called type 1 and type 2 um, kinds of thinking, which can lead us to make wrong decisions about things like risk, um, which um, crooks, terrorists, governments, marketers, and so on can exploit. And finally, we mustn't make the mistake of thinking that people are all individual, that every man is an island, uh, because there's social psychology too, which is extraordinarily important in driving how people behave. Now let's start off with error rates. Skill is more reliable than knowledge and practice really, really helps. In the motor industry, for example, we've got the following um, hierarchy um, of expected errors. Inexplicable errors which are stress-free with the right cues might happen one action in 100,000. Um, regularly perform simple tasks with low stress. Um, might be an order of magnitude uh, more frequent than that. Where you've got complex tasks with little time and some cues needed. Um, it might be one error in a thousand. Think, for example, you know, turning right across traffic in a, in a busy road. An unfamiliar task dependent on situation on memory, um, recovering from some um, partial failure of a car, for example. Suppose that the cruise control kicks in and starts accelerating you um, when you're uh, trying to decelerate um, going up an off-ramp from a motorway. Then the risk that you get things wrong then and screw up and have a crash might be one in a hundred. If you've got a highly complex task with an awful lot of stress, for example, um, flying an aircraft when one of the engines has just failed en route and there's 40 different alarms going off in the cockpit, the chance that you screw that up might be one in ten. And where you have to indulge in creative thinking and do unfamiliar complex operations where time is short and the stress is high, then you may screw up as often as not. And risk hierarchies like these are used in the motor industry and in the aircraft industry and elsewhere to try and figure out um, how you can um, set things up so that um, problems can be managed in a way that um, minimizes the risk of a bad thing happening. Now, it's not enough to know just the error rates. You have to think about the error types. Now, I mentioned slips and lapses, and there's a number of types of um, slips, uh, slips and lapses that we have to think about. You can forget plans and intentions, and um, habit intrusion is something to watch out uh, for here. Uh, for example, when I come out of the computer lab, I usually turn left onto the uh, Mattingly Road and then turn left onto the M11 so that I can go home. Um, but about um, once a week, I go to my daughter's to see the kids, and um, then I'm supposed to go along the Mattingly Road towards Camborne, and it can happen that on a day when I'm supposed to go to Canberra and I find myself going down the M11 because it was just the, the thing I usually do is to turn left onto the motorway. 
In a similar way, you can misidentify objects and signals when you're using Bayesian type inference, and um, uh, high probability signals can displace low probability signals, and in some cases the other way around. You can also have retrieval failures from memory. Um, you've probably been embarrassed at least once when you've forgotten somebody's name when it's at the tip of your tongue. And things can also interfere in that you can greet someone by the wrong name um, if they have red hair and there's someone you know um, whom you meet more often who's got red hair uh, because one memory interferes with another. Another type of lapse is premature exits from action sequences. Now, when you go to an ATM in the UK, it usually gives you your money back first uh, and your card back only second. Uh, whereas in the USA, you often find that it gives you your card back first and the money only second. And the reason that UK banks give you back your card last um, is that if you do it the American way, then it's um, surprisingly common for people to leave their card in the cash machine. Because if you go to a cash machine with a purpose of getting a hundred bucks and you suddenly got your hundred bucks in your hand, then if anything happens to distract you, you know, um, uh, somebody hollers next to you or somebody brushes past you or somebody starts up a car, you can simply forget that you're supposed to now collect your card from the cash machine. And as a result, your card gets swallowed and then the bank's got to issue you with a new card. There are also rule-based mistakes where people apply the wrong procedure. And this is a particular issue where people get trained very, very hard to perform some particular procedure. The one time this almost bit me uh, was when I was in my 20s and I first got a job with a bank. So I was earning tons and tons of money. And I went and did some flying lessons just to splurge. And I was coming back to the airfield um, having... Um, flying, been flying around vigorously, burning up lots of fuel, and I realized I didn't really have as much fuel as I should. And then as I approached the runway, the plane in front of me stopped on the runway. And so the missed approach procedure is something that they drill into you again and again and again. If the runway is blocked, then once you get to the end of the runway, you open up the throttle, pull up the nose, and you go around for another go. So uh, this kicked in, and I found myself taking off in an aircraft with um, almost zero fuel indicated in both tanks. You know, fortunately, the fuel gauges were, um, you know, um, aired on the wrong side, and there was enough petrol for me to get back. But that's an example of how if you train somebody very, very hard to do something on the grounds of safety, then in the wrong circumstances that can kick in and can potentially kill people instead. There are also knowledge-based mistakes if people simply remember the wrong facts or um, apply them in the wrong context. And then there are heuristics and biases based on how our brains work. Because although um, the higher parts of our brains um, operate in terms of, of logic, the um, more primitive parts of our brains um, operate in a much more associative and visceral way. And these primitive parts of our brains are the um, parts which are responsible for digging up memories. And the, these heuristics and biases, as they're called, are very, very important for understanding behavior around risk. For example, when estimating the risk of something, we use something called the availability heuristic, which is that you think of the most vivid example um, of the thing that you're trying to assess, and you apply that as a yardstick. So after the terrorist attacks in 9-11, we all had memories of very um, lurid attacks where planes were flown into buildings and thousands of people died. And as a result, people started being much more leery of terrorism, because previously the memories that they had of terrorism were perhaps you know, uh, footage from a distance of a bomb going off in Omar or whatever. Uh, but all of a sudden, people had a very, very lurid, vivid um, um, idea of what terrorism could do. And so as a result, the um, negative um, valence given to terrorism was um, enormously increased. In order to see this in a slightly more um, quantitative way, um, there's a theory called prospect theory due to um, Kahneman and Tversky, which gives us a reasonable model of some aspects of risk misperception. And 
this is um, a way of quantifying the old saying that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, if people were risk neutral, they would be um, entirely um, not bothered whether they, you, you offered to give them £10 or a 50% chance of winning £20. However, if you actually offer people in the psychology lab either £10 or a 50% chance of £20, um, they'll usually prefer the £20. But if, on the other hand, you offer them a loss of £10 or a 50% chance of a loss of £20, then they tend to prefer the latter. And this has been tested very, very thoroughly in experiments, you know, to test the um, reaction to a loss, you um, give the experimental subjects 20 pounds or two coffee mugs or whatever, and um, you say, well, we're now either going to take away 10 pounds or a 50% chance of taking away 20 pounds, or we're going to take away one coffee mug or a 50% chance of taking away two coffee mugs. And consistently, people um, prefer to gamble if they're talking about um, relatively small losses. And so you can graph this out, and as you can see in the graph, the, the red graph um, shows the utility that people actually um, give to gains and losses in these circumstances. Now, how does this matter? Well, suppose you are busy um, advising the Prime Minister about um, whether a new... Uh, vaccine should be given to people uh, uh, in the subject in the context of a flu pandemic. Now, this is an old, old problem, an, an old example, one that's become um, tragically very salient at the moment. Uh, but this is something that has been uh, put to policymakers and to experimental subjects for about 20 years now. And typically, you put two options to the subjects. First, you say, well, Prime Minister, we can give um, the um, known treatment, um, in which case 200,000 lives will be saved. Suppose that social distancing, for example. Um, or option B is we're going to give this new vaccine, and in that case, with probability one-third, 600,000 lives will be saved. Um, but with probability two-thirds, none will be saved. 600,000 will die. And here, 72% choose A over B. Yet in expectation, um, a certainty of saving 200,000 people um, has the same utility um, in the sense that insurance company actuaries would ascribe it as a one-third chance of saving 600,000 people. Now, the second option you put to subjects is that, um, well, Prime Minister, if you continue with the current course of action, then um, 400,000 people will die. However, if we try this uh, new vaccine, uh, then with probability one-third, no one will die, and with probability two-thirds, 600,000 will die. And here, 78% prefer the euro C. So if you have the government's chief scientific advisor and chief medical officer giving advice to the cabinet about whether a particular um, stratagem or vaccine or treatment or whatever should be used, it is really, really important how it's, how it's pitched. Is it pitched... Um, in terms of um, definite savings or in terms of probabilistic savings? Is it pitched in terms of definite losses or probabilistic losses? And this is actually why marketers talk about discount or saving, and fraudsters know that people facing losses are likely to take more risks.